Uh, so, our special guest today is Andy Farrow. Everybody say hi. Okay, so, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, making the effort. <laughs> Going through the standard stuff. Uh, yeah, so, first of all, uh, whoever has questions, Andy is more than happy to, to answer them during this conversation. Uh, okay, so we're going to start with a bit of background. Uh, Andy started in uh, the early 80s in the UK when basically uh, there, was a, there was a very strong uh, feeling of independence of the, of the do-it-yourself stuff. The metal scene was basically in its first phases. Like Iron Maiden was just starting to, to grow, like Napalm Death were just uh, forming Harvest World even around then. Uh, so basically, you started at a very young age, around 15, 16 years old. Uh, can you tell me a bit about how did you manage to, to get things started in the 80s in this, in involving this whole do-it-yourself concept? Um, yeah, I was a, a, a vocalist, I wouldn't say a singer, in a kind of a punk band. Like the, the narco punk scene was all about tape trading, so I ended up uh, booking all the gigs, um, doing fanzines and selling tapes and trading them all the build. So that, that, that's really how I started, was in a band and then I was the guy that organized everything. This is before the internet, so it was all about uh, uh, selling stuff by post and we used to uh, put soap over the stamps and tell people to, to wipe it off and reuse it and we would uh, sell cassettes all over the world. And then I, I went to, so that was about 16 years old, I went to college and when I left college, I set my company up, and when I was 21, I had a band signed to uh, Warner Brothers. They were a thrash metal band. So my background was punk, and I kind of moved into metal because it was uh, all about the underground scene, so there, there were similarities there. Talking about, uh, it's a really interesting, exactly how you put it, like establishing uh, some sort of national network before any uh, means of communication, like the internet, obviously, which is a, is a very you know, efficient tool nowadays. Uh, how did you manage to first set up this, this national network in the UK? Uh, in those days, it was like everybody did fanzines, and you would sell fanzines, and you'd write about your scene. And then there were bands like Crass, these kind of anarcho punk bands, that they did a benefit gig for us and we put um, 10 bands in the studio and then uh, we would sell the compilation. So I, I started very much a local scene in the city where I lived and everything was done through uh, word of mouth and, and fans. And and then you, you started to, uh, to get involved more seriously in, in the whole record industry. Uh, was it, did you have like specific education in this sense or basically you just were forced to learn everything? Okay, these, these days there are degrees in the music industry where, where obviously when I started out I had to learn everything as I went along. So. I'm 21 years old, I've got a band on Warners, I know a lot more now than I did. And uh, you know, this particular band, you know, supported Ozzy Osbourne, uh, produced, the first album was by Mark Dodson, who did Anthrax and stuff, so I learned as I went along. The music industry is very confusing and you know, sometimes bands come to me and show me their contracts and they're terrible. So I'm a real fighter for bands because I think a lot of bands have been screwed by the business and um, they, you know, they just want to put a record out and they don't look at what they're signing and stuff. So it is important to maybe uh, read up on certain things or do a course, but if you, know, if you wanted to get into the business, the best thing to do is to be an intern in a company and learn that way because much like any job, you learn through experience as opposed to just reading about it. And about that, what was the, I don't know, the first major difficult point in uh, working in this record industry at that time? The, 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 
for me, it was uh, band smashing up studios, but, uh, you know, because this was back in the day where there was a lot more money about the music industry, and, the, you know, people were making albums for 80 to 100,000 pounds, and, you know, when you're a manager of a band, you're creative band, band members, sometimes you're a bit irrational, and this band I had did smash up the studio, and we got huge bills, so, it was kind of difficult because as a manager you've got to look after the band and then deal with all the business so it's uh it's you 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 are like the father the psychologist the doctor and the businessman so it's kind of, you have to, to spread your experience everywhere but you know you have to remember you're dealing with people so uh jumping from the small experience afterwards the northern music company came up what was the whole idea about that? Originally it was called Far North Music and it was about, uh, there was no music industry outside of London in Britain, so our aim was to sign bands from the North and focus on being artists, uh, close to the artists, and then the Manchester scene happened, so the name is related to the fact um, that we were outside of the capital, you know, it's much like you here compared to Bucharest and stuff, so that is where the name comes from, that we're kind of based in the north of England and it's nothing to do with Scandinavia, even though I have a lot of Scandinavian about. <laughs> we'll get to that uh, later. Uh, what was the first band you signed with Norman? Uh, but you talk about professionally, like that, that got actually signed. No, no, no. The, the first band you ever collaborated with under this name. Oh, under that name, well, it would have been a. It was called Far North News then. It was a band called Slammer that were a thrash metal band. It was uh, Metallica, Slayer, Anthrax had just come out. And I basically sold the band to the record labels, talking about the big four thrash bands. I'm, I'm 20, 21 years old, and they believed everything I say. But when I went to America, I'm 21, I slept in Heathrow Airport, I got to Hollywood, I was like, where's Hollywood? And the Americans were like, well, why do we need your band? Because your band is basically copying what Metallica, Testament, etc., are doing. So, you know, I was a young guy, and that's why, I mean, I'm very approachable because, you know, when I'm 21 and I was trying to meet the manager of Megadeth or someone and he didn't turn up for the meeting, but, uh, that was, that was the first band that was signed, then there was a band called Loud that were alternative, and then uh, I kind of, Paradise Lost, I, I managed that band for 23 years, they just had a gothic album out, and I put a gig on and I saw that they sold a lot of t-shirts, but what was interesting, this band went to Europe, when I say Europe in England, we always think England and Europe, but they went to Holland, they went to Germany, so they had an international uh, scene going on, which was good. So I've been involved with them for 23 years. Well, speaking about this, one of the major problems with young bands nowadays, they don't really have a strategy uh, to promote themselves. And obviously from your point of view, how do you sell a band, basically? To either promoters, management, uh, record labels and so on. I think the big thing with the industry is that, especially in America, there was like metalcore came out, and oh, it's another band that sounds like this. I think you've got to be original, but sometimes the music industry, if they can't put you in a box, they don't know what to do with you. But if you build a fan base, they're going to have to take notice. When Marillion came along, everyone says, oh, this is like Genesis, but it built a big fan base. So, you know. As far as promoting yourselves, it's about the fans. You have to know who your fans are. There was, a, I was on doing a panel in LA last week, and a, a manager said your job as a band is to be a fan aggregator, which is kind of weird. So you have to know who your fans are. I'm not into the way, say, something like Victory Records, where they put for fans of. If I, one of my bands had an advert saying for fans of these others, because everybody wants to be original. Luckily, on the management side, I have got some of the bands that are leaders of a certain genre. So uh, I would say if you're in bands, it's about you build your fan base, you know who your fan base is. If it's big enough, the business is going to have to come to you. Otherwise, it's uh, 
you can do it where critical reviews and people are like this, this music is very good and then they will take it and market it but you know at the end of the day as a band you are a business it doesn't matter about record label whatever you have to build your fan base and you know eventually people, people, people will come to you so obviously bands in Romania it's very tough because of where you're based it's harder for you, but it's not impossible with the internet, you know, the world is smaller and you know, what I've seen here, there's a very good scene and you know, two of the bands I saw last night were very good and the standard's high, so you know, you mustn't um, kind of give up on stuff, but it's like, don't just rely on other people to market you, because if you do a gig you know, if the record company's pushing you and you do a gig and you're no good, then you're not selling yourself because nobody can sell you better than yourself and how do you build a fan base nowadays? I mean, are touring and shows just enough to, to do that? Well, I mean, certain bands build fan bases using social media. I mean, obviously you can buy Facebook likes and stuff, but yeah, touring is very important. If you're a metal band, you don't get radio and TV, so it's always been about touring. So I would say, yeah, you do a lot of tours, you have a strong logo and identity, and on the internet, you've got to give fans things that they won't necessarily see in a magazine. So engage with your fan base, but don't oversell. So you're, you're not a big fan of aggressive promotion? Well, I think, you know, they, they, they teach you, like, uh, Facebook, if you're constantly selling, selling, somebody's going to walk away. It's like I asked him how many gigs you have here. If there was gigs every night, then, then you know, people wouldn't come as much. So. It's about getting the balance of how you promote yourself. But the thing with the internet is you can give away music. People can hear, you You have no record deal, but you could go to a place and people are singing your songs. Now, when I started out, the only way you could find out, you would read about a band, and then if it was on a cover mag of a magazine, that would be how you find out. There was no radio or TV for, for, for many bands, whereas now, you know, YouTube is how people view music. The other thing when you talk about promotion, you know, in Scandinavia, 83% of people consume music by streaming, e e even black metal. So uh, you have to find out how a country uh, consumes its music and, you know, how, how they listen to it. And uh, talking about Scandinavia, a lot of bands that are right now managed by you uh, or have like uh, booking uh, deals with more music aren't from the UK, they're actually like a lot of from Scandinavia. Uh, did you contact them? Did they contact you? How did you manage to like create this wide, uh, wide partnership? Now you have Solstafir from, from Iceland, yeah. as, uh, which is a pretty exotic place. Uh, I haven't been yet, but... Um... <laughs> Uh, the Scandinavian Connection, the first band I did from Sweden was a band called Misery Loves Company, we're on Air 8 Records, and when I was managing Paradise Lost, we're on Music for Nations, and the MD of Music for Nations said, we've got six bands that need managers, and one of them was Opeth. So I listened to it, and I thought, oh, that sounds a bit like Paradise Lost, and so I met the band, and then I took on Opeth, and after Opeth, Mike's obviously friends with Anders, Catatonia, um, and then, it, you know, I did soil work for a bit, so I've always been going to Scandinavia. And the other thing is, musically, the Scandinavians, you know, the, the, the guitar playing, I don't know if it's because it's dark in, in the winter, but they do a lot of rehearsal, and I actually think te their technical ability is so good, and you kind of notice it. You know, the biggest rock metal bands in the world, I would say, have come out of Britain, but these days, they don't necessarily compete with the musicianship that you get from Scandinavia. So I'm always finding really great bands there. And I, I have another company in Sweden that I'm 15% in that manages mainly Swedish bands. And promoting a band, uh, do you have a different approach uh, considering uh, the music style? In, in terms of promotion and getting the band out there? Well, I think when you talk about music style, say for example, like I manage Anathema, now that band's history is the, you know, the original Peaceville 3, Paradise Lost, My Dying Bride, Anathema. Now where Anathema are musically now, 
they're like, oh, we don't want to be doing all this metal stuff. But the problem is because they've got a history, that's where their fan base is. So it's, as far as promoting bands, I think uh, you have to really talk to the band on, on what they want to see. So for example, there's a band called uh, Grave Pleasures. I've signed them, we call Beast Milk. Now their first press was in Terrorizer. Now their background was metal, but the music's post-punk. So you have to think, do we want metal press? Because that means indie press won't be interested. There's a lot of snobbery, more so in the independent rock scene and the folk scene than there is in metal. And it's very hard to cross that over. So it's very important you know, where you present yourself in, in, in terms of uh, magazines or coverage. And uh, obviously, like Opeth is probably the most successful uh, band on the roster right now. Uh, but it's also you managed to to go over three million uh, CD sold mm. until now, uh, and I wanted to ask you like, what was the feeling when you, you when you reached the first million, which is obviously probably impossible now in, in 2015 for a band. Yeah, I mean that three million was over several albums. I mean Opeth's the most successful band now, but I would say back in the time, Paradise Lost, Draconian Times. I mean in, in Germany it sold two hundred and seventy thousand, and it's very uh, record sales are so different now that you know if you sell ten thousand in the UK you are happy. So any band, if you sell a hundred thousand worldwide, you can have a career. It doesn't mean you make a lot of money, but that's a substantial amount. There are still bands like Royal Blood came out in England and their first album did 76,000 in a week, which gives me hope. So people are still buying records, but I would say you know, on the metal scene, it's, uh, you know, people buy t-shirts, they're very loyal, but yeah, the, the, the number that you sell is, is, is not as big. But as far as getting to a million, I don't really think about sales now. I mean, I will put up on Facebook, we were in the charts, um, and somebody said to me, how many does that mean? You know, like in, in England, you could go top five and sell 8,000 albums, which in the 70s, people would sell hundreds of thousands. So it's all different economies of scale now. But you know, I mean, even getting a gold disc in for five, ten thousand in some small territory, but it does also make the band feel good to have these kind of things. Mentioning Royal Blood, it's really uh, it's quite a good example of what success would mean right now because, like, Royal Blood is not your usual alternative band, uh, so it's still like or being original and uh, having an identity is probably it's still the most important thing nowadays for a band yeah being original obviously is one thing but i still think certain uh, when you deal with americans they very much want to put you into a certain slot so you know if you say to somebody i was talking to a band earlier what kind of music and they couldn't tell me it was you and <laughs> So, you know, they want to fit you into something because there's always scenes, you know, whether it's like, you know, you've had death metal, thrash metal, gothic metal, now it's all about these two-piece bands, so... I, you know, being original, yes, you, you can have success, but sometimes by being original it's difficult because people are not clever enough to know how to sell, because it's easier to just sell something that's the same as what they're selling. You know, like, uh, I mean, you go back to the punk times, I mean, Sex Pistols, The Dam got signed, there were loads of punk bands, every major label signed them. U2 came out, there's loads of bands like U2, so, so the record, the music industry just follows what's going on. They're not necessarily looking for the most original, you know, for a band like Opeth, you know, there's no choruses, it's eight minute long songs. The record label said to me, oh, you know, we wouldn't put our name on the front. And he's going, oh, this is a terrible idea. But I'm into doing bands that are different, that aren't necessarily, you know, we don't have record labels getting involved in the songs. And the bands are kind of like an intelligent listen, but it's very difficult, how do you, market these bands because if a band is progressive metal and they, they're eight minute long songs at a festival they're not going to have the crowd going crazy whereas a band that makes people jump up and down will seem like the, the more successful one but um 
going back to the thing of originality, yeah, obviously to be original is very important, but the problem is it's about whether there's people out there that see the originality and know how to, how to sell it, because everybody, you know, you've got different things, like napalm death are the Heinz baked beans of grindcore, you know, you have different, uh, you know, sub-genres and people know how to sell it. So if, if you're slightly different, they wouldn't know. And the thing with metal, you know, there's been all kinds of different influences and folk metal, pagan metal, pirate metal. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> you know, and they are seen. So pirate metal, for example, live, is it does really well. I mean, as to how many records they sell, I don't know. It's not as big. So you have certain bands that, that, that do well on the live scene, but, but it doesn't translate to, to listen, you know. So I saw bands last night, and I say, all right, you were really good live, but I want to hear the album as well. Um, but yeah, going back to your point on originality, obviously be original, but sometimes I can hinder you in a way. And it's very it's very hard to like bring a band from, a, you mentioned Opeth, for example, there are they are one of the very very few bands that managed to play Royal Albert Hall, which is a legendary venue, and it's not necessarily uh, it's not very oriented to, to these kinds of shows. And how do you manage to bring from the from point A to point B? Right. I mean, what I do for a strategy for bands playing live is I, I, I don't just go for the most money. It's about okay, we'll start here and I'll take you there. I said to Opeth you'll be doing Wembley, and they said no way. Unfortunately, they were supporting Dream Theatre, but they did get there. So the Royal Albert Hall thing is that I mark the OPEF as the kind of Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin of the metal scene. So we want to do stuff that's different. So they're the heaviest band ever to play there, apart from Devin Townsend I had in there the other week. But it's, so playing a gig like that, you don't make money because it's very expensive. But what I want to do with them is to make the difference so they stand out. So uh, that was all planned. And at the 25th anniversary, we're doing the London Palladium. And they the, they'll be the heaviest band ever to play there. And you know, two, three weeks ago, I had Devin Townsend at the Royal Albert Hall sold out in four days, which is amazing. But if you're looking at finances, you make more money playing Brixton Academy. But I'm into doing things that are different. Opeth were the first rock metal band to play the Roundhouse. Now the Roundhouse was where Pink Floyd used to play. So I'm always looking at opportunities that make them stand out. So I was in Australia, I met the guy from Sydney Opera House. He never replies to emails. I'm pissed off about it, but I want them to play there. So I'm, I think that if you do that kind of thing, also the internet, everybody sees you as different, you're a leader, instead of you're just doing the usual. And this is something I see that agents, certain booking agencies in Europe, we were discussing the Camden Underworld, they always put bands in the same venues because they go for money as opposed to having a strategy. When I was managing Satyricon, they were kind of thinking they were bigger than they were. And I'm like, you need to play in smaller venues and sell out instead of having an ego and playing in an empty place. And when I took on Anathema in the UK, they sold out all the small gigs. And I, then they're going, should we upgrade? I went, no, no, you've got to create the demand. So on the live front, uh, it's all about strategy. Now that's an interesting thing to see live. My main business is management, but now the record sales are down, the live side's very important. So, you know, I do book some of the bands. So Bloodbath, for example, are only doing festivals. They're doing 14 festivals and we're limiting it. And they've been offered tours, but they just, just get, so the strategy with them is they will only play festivals. It's, it's, it's a side band and they've got their other bands. But it, the, the whole live thing, yeah, you've got to know where you go. From a financial point of view, in the UK, if you sell 15,000 albums, you can play Brixton Academy, that's like a 25,000, 30,000 pound gig. So you have to think in strategies like that, but it's, it's so important that you play somewhere that's different, you know, or that, 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 that creates some interest. So, you know, if a band is doing the Royal Albert Hall, and I had Dave in there, I, all the journalists were there. I had Anathema doing Resonance, doing their old set. Every journalist there, I've seen the Kerrang reviews, 5Ks, probably a good review. So 
It's about creating something that's different because in countries where there's loads of gigs, oh, it's another gig. You know, you've got, that is how you're going to stand out. But live strategy is so important now. And uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, Eastern Europe and, and Romania. Uh, obviously, for, for, for some point of view, it's like uh, it's an emerging market. But uh, you have obviously had some contacts uh, bringing bands, uh, including like several festivals in Romania, different bands. What's your point of view about Romania, Eastern Europe in general compared to Central Europe, Western Europe, where obviously uh, everything is more solid, more safe? I mean, places like, like Eastern Europe are very important to me, emerging markets, because historically, even going back, I would have a band tour in Germany play to 50 people and they crossed over to Poland and there's 2,000 people because they're loving it because they don't get as much music so the owner, Roadrunner at the time I was going on and on about Poland he's like why do you bother with Poland and I said Poland is going to be a good market and it is now you can sell 10,000 they've got the biggest festival in the world there with Woodstock so all of these territories have always been important. I was in Bulgaria recently and a promoter told me like Paradise Lost are more known than Opeth, mainly because they were one of the first bands to go there. And also you look at Napalm Death, they, they go into territories that other bands haven't been. So for, for me, Eastern Europe is very important because I think that, I'm not saying you've been starved of music, but it's very much like, uh, Anywhere that doesn't have access to music, they really want it. And it's the same in the Middle East, you know, there's a, there's a big scene there. Israel get, gets all the bands and then Islamic countries don't, but there's a big scene. So I think that also psychologically, if you're on a tour, some of the Eastern European gigs will be the best received. Whereas if you're playing in Berlin, they've seen it all before. So, I mean, it's very important to me because live is important and also you, in a book, I'll tell you something about festivals. You make more money in Eastern Europe. As a country, you have less money than Germany. They don't pay as much. That's why they have more money. <laughs> Going back uh, on bands, I want to talk about a bit about uh, this image in the back, which is pretty much a very detailed structure about what the artist is and what's what are the relationships uh, with the other branches now uh, a lot of people musicians in romania maybe are aren't so much familiar with all the details so maybe we can make a, a brief introduction about everything involved here okay so at the top you've got the artist now if an artist doesn't have a manager and they get offered a record deal they might go to a lawyer and a lawyer will probably say don't sign, but anyway. And then once they've set up their business, they have an accountant. So what you have to remember is a lot of bands think that they are working for the manager. They're not. The manager doesn't work for them. It's like a, a partnership thing, but it's a separate business. So that's why when you've got artist, lawyer, accountant, and then it joins with the manager, and then the manager is going to sell to the agent, the record label, and the publisher. So the agent, I presume you all know, the agent's job is to book the gigs. The record label is to license or you have a record deal and, and, and sell the album. And then the publisher, that's where you, the person you assign is your songwriting, so you would assign it for a number of years. And it's a different kind of royalty. And it's very important these days because Declining record sales, you can still make money in publishing. If you get an advert, I had a band that um, sold 20,000 albums, did an advert for Orange Mobile Phone, it grossed one million. So I've got 65 days of static of doing a uh, soundtrack for No Man's Sky, which will be the biggest game this year. So, so publishing is very important. And then with the record label, A&R stands for Artist and Repertoire. So that is the person at the label that finds the band and signs the band. But the important thing, if it's a metal label, the A&R man is often the product manager. But you always think when you meet the label, you want to know about the product manager, because he's the guy who does the marketing. So if you're on a major label, the A&R guy signs you, but the product manager is very important. Um, yeah, promotion, that's, that's stuff like press and TV, or, uh, 
digitally and within the record label. Um, obviously got press marketing. The distributor is the company that puts the albums out into the shops or however they do it. So major record labels also own distribution. But you've been, if you're a DIY artist, you can have your own album, you go to a distributor direct, and then you miss everybody out. So it's still there. Obviously retail marketplace, live. So PRS, MCPS, I mean, in Romania, what's your collection society called? UCMR. Um, well, I can't pronounce that anyway. <laughs> So that, if you're a songwriter, it's very important that you become a member of the songwriting society. So when you play live, if you play in England, 3% of the gross receipts are collected by PRS and then they would filter back to Romania. Probably loads of deductions, but that's very important because as a songwriter, you can earn royalties. So if it's played on the radio, the TV, from live. So very important. MCPS is about a mechanical. So when you press a CD, there's a thing called a mechanical copyright within the CD, and it's about 50 cents. So that is publishing income. So if you don't have a publishing deal, you can join these societies direct. I'm not sure what you do here. You know, I've had promoters in Poland say, just sign here, we'll forget about the PRS. <laughs> yeah, the main problem in, in one of the problems uh, in Romania with artists, there are, they don't uh, get all documented with, with these, uh, the rights that they have. That, that's one of the big problems. But uh, what, uh, from, from all these uh, branches, what branches are applied to, to the underground bands, to the independent bands? Well, I mean, if you're an independent band, membership of songwriting society, you know, you make your recording, distributor, and then promotion. So it's still, if you do it yourself, you know, you can either hire a PR company or you do a distribution deal. So those elements are there, but it's very important that you, 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 you sort your songwriting out because in the old days, there was a thing called Life of Copyrights. So the Beatles catalog came to sale and Paul McCartney was outbid by Michael Jackson. So he doesn't even own his own songs. Those kind of deals are illegal now. You do see them sometimes with metal labels. But always avoid Life of Copyrights. So, you know, I would make sure, you know, you're, 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 Songwriting societies, I don't know what they do here, but they, they, they do give you some information, there's some budgets, and they, you know, they'll give you a bit of knowledge. Because songwriting's a big area that people don't have a clue about. The first record I put out in the punk days, I got a bill from MCPS, and I'm like, what's this? It's going in the bin, this is our record. So people forget, they just want to put a record out. And uh, it's very important that the, the songwriting, because that, if somebody covers your song, like I don't know if you knew Doctor and the Medic, Spirit in the Sky was written by a Norman Greenbaum who just died recently, but so 20 years later he's making money. So the songwriting side is so important for you to protect because people do covers, uh, Metallica did... Uh, uh, garaging. Yeah, garaging, you know, so they did, I was in here last night, and you know where they, so what, you know, so some of these punk bands will have made some money because a band like Metallica covered it, but much like The Damned, apart from Brian James, most of them had a very bad publishing, so they won't be making the money, so, so that's a really important thing, but you know, so if you're a DIY band, yeah, you can go straight to the distributor, but you should still you know, definitely look at the songwriting area and also within the band it's be very clear about who's written what because for example with the Smiths the drummer Morrissey was a bit of a bastard to them and he made, still is uh, and like uh, there's lawsuits that's so important because that's the thing that can really generate money and you might be all best friends but who knows I mean look at Oasis they're brothers and people fall out um, how do you tour nowadays in 2015 for, for an independent band? Well, getting a van. I mean, the thing is that dealing with different bands around the world, like Norwegian band, Nor Norway's got a lot of money, but they expect a tour bus, this, that and the other. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm from the days of uh, you get in the back of a van, you pee in a bucket, 
and that's how you do it. That's illegal now. People want splitters and stuff, but it's like touring. My bands are at a level where they have tour buses, but you know, you, you get in the van and you do it. I've had people so on the internet, they say, we're playing this tank, can you put us up? So, so you do it punk rock, if you, 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 you know, if that's the only option. Because people, I think, in our lives now, we expect so much more. So even an unsigned band, oh, I must have the nine line, I must have this, you know? It's like, I had a, a band years ago and they said, how do we get round? I'm like, you take a tent and just do it. And I know solo people that go on cheap, these mega buses in England is five pounds, you know, from London to, to Edinburgh, and that's how they do it that way. So, yeah, touring depends on the level. But the thing is, when you're a big band, you've got a tour bus, that's like a thousand euros a day, there's a crew, and it actually don't make money. So, you know, you, what you can do is get a van, there's cheap places, they call them Formula Ones in Europe, and there's travel lodges in England, and you book them all up front, and that's how you do it. Because it's like sometimes in London, even a crappy hotel is 200 pounds. You stay outside. Uh, one of the, let's say, contemporary examples about this is actually uh, Parkway Drive, which is nowadays uh, one of the most successful metal bands. But uh, when they started doing Europe, uh, they basically finished touring all over Australia. There were no places yeah. to go, and they basically just flew in Europe and spent a couple of months on, on in a van and just mailed guys out like look we wanna we wanna play a show. Uh, there were some footages like playing in, in Belgium uh, with a venue in there were like two, three people, one year later two thousand people sold out. Uh, so yeah nowadays they're they the success is overwhelming. I mean, Basically, it was the whole do-it-yourself concept, which is pretty much missing nowadays. I mean, yeah, as you said, like everybody wants it, wants everything to fall out of the sky. Yeah, you know, the do-it-yourself, you've always got to have that. Nobody's going to do it for you. You know, even your manager, he, he's going to have his own agenda. So, you know, I think do-it-yourself is still going to be there. But I just think that maybe people expect too much. It's like, oh, I'm in a band, I've got a record deal, I've got some news for you, you're not going to make any money initially. You are a, a business, you have to build your business and find your fan base. Uh, how do booking agents approach uh, Europe now? Go to emerging markets. No, um, <laughs> uh, well, booking agents, obviously we have a booking division and, you know, as a manager, I think the agent has got the easiest job because they sell the band, they don't have to deal with the travel, the withholding tax, and some of them don't know their geography. Especially with Americans booking booking gigs in Europe, they don't realize the distances. So, uh, what was the question again then? <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm tired. Uh, no, the, I was really curious about booking agencies. Uh, how they approach you. Yeah, how they approach, like they have all these different ideas about but, every well, place. Well, well, how it works, you see, the agent is not necessarily going to each individual club promoter. So in Germany, you have a national promoter and they sell it on to the clubs. So me as a manager, I'm thinking people are making money all the way along. The agent should really deal with individual people. But yeah, so what they do is whoever the band's national promoter is, they then sell it around the country. But it's um, the whole, you know, the whole touring, you know, I've had Opeth played in the Maldives, you know, we get offers from India, just had an offer from Beirut, you know, the whole market's opened up and I mean, Europe is, uh, it's quite easy to deal with. The worst thing from a touring point of view is the taxes. We're all in the EU, there's different VAT. Italy just are on their, do their own thing, and Greece is always saying, oh, we have no money, but it's, I can't see, you know, that's one thing that is very strange running a business. France is very bureaucratic, so you come to, to, to Holland, there's no withholding tax. So something you have to think about as a band when you tour, there's different taxes. So if you do a budget and you don't know about these things, you could come back with a big loss. I mean, if you're doing DIY underground or you know, bubble, you pay the tax here. But other other places in Germany, they're very very strict about it. So, so the agent, they don't worry about all that. But the manager or the band, you need to think about that. So the agent will say, yeah, I've got you ten thousand pounds. 
he will earn 10%, you might pay, say in Spain, this 15% tax. So you need to uh, think about that size. And that's why when you actually, as a band, if you're looking at a market you want to work on, is also look at the taxes, look at whether, how they consume music. You know, the thing is that Scandinavia has got a lot of money, so it's like it is worth focusing on some of those because they pay so much more for festivals because their standard of living is higher. You mentioned about budget. Uh, how does one band, uh, I don't know, make a strategy on budget when they go on tours, especially like small bands because there are a lot of people here who are in bands, they want to tour, but obviously the, the whole budget, economic system works uh, in the, the whole opposite direction. And how do you make like uh, make a steady budget? How, where do you cut uh, expenses and so on? For, for me, I mean obviously it's not a DIY. The bigger bands want loads of road crew, they want separate rooms, so it's like if it's a smaller band, but I've got some bands I've managed a long time who realize life's where the money is, so you cut down on the crew, you make sure people share and things like that. But the other important thing from a DIY point of view is that when you go on tour, now, in the metal scene, somebody said you're all purveyors of cloth. Now, people buy t-shirts. The, the reality is that a CD, people won't spend as much on a CD as a t-shirt. So it's also about getting the pricing right. But you've got to make sure you've got merchandise, you've got music for your budget. Because that, the, the gig fees alone are not going to cover it. So you have to do that. And if it's DIY, like bands on the walk tour, you do the gig, you go to your merch store, you meet your fans, and you sell. Uh, so that's a way of getting the income in. As far as your overall budget, you have to, as again, look at the taxes, look at whatever commissions there are, tolls in different countries, and things like that. And also, when right you route to tour, you got to remember that petrol costs different amounts in different countries. Some countries are very expensive, so you have to put all of these factors in. About, you mentioned about merchandise, which is obviously like uh, the top selling point for a band. Now, how do you approach merchandise in terms of getting sold? I mean, making it uh, fancy, if you, if you get the point. Well, you know, with merchandise, when, when I was man well, managing OPEF, and I looked and I thought, oh, these merchandisers are making too much money. Let's set up our own company and, and sign bands. The thing is, with merchandise, you can be flash, but in metal, at the end of the day, they're like a black t-shirt. That is the biggest seller. So again, it's about knowing your audience. You go to America, they're like wife beaters. They call them those vests. <laughs> Sorry for that, girls. But it's uh, so it's um, yeah. So also, it's, it's about knowing what works for your audience. So what's interesting is that the more extreme of the band, they seem to sell more t-shirts. So for example, band like Elbow. You know, it's an indie rock band, they will do one pound a head. Somebody like Slayer is doing nine, ten. I mean, OPEF do eight, so the metal scene is great for merchandise, and that's really, really important. And uh, yeah, it's about knowing, but also being slightly different. The thing is that uh, the other thing you have to know with merchandise going around different countries. There's a big difference in the sizes of people. Like I was given a medium shirt here, I said, well, I've lost weight, but I don't know about a medium. So medium in England is, is, is very small. So, you know, when you go to Germany, the people are bigger. In America, they want double XL. So that's another thing to think about with your merchandise. Look at the diets of your fans before you decide on the sizes and the quantities. Go on Facebook and spy. Yeah. Um, regarding uh, records, um, what's your point of view on digital sales, vinyls, and obviously the standard CD, which is going down, okay. down, down? Well, they say it's going down. I mean, digital in the UK is still only something like 36%. The good news is vinyl is back. Now, personally, people buy vinyl, they don't have record players, but it's the collection, it's the feel. The problem is, Artwork was very important and then all of a sudden it's reduced to a CD and then now it's digital. The day it's all digital, I'll be bored. But I have a record label and digital is like printing money without leftovers because all my CDs the distributor returns them. I'm like, I'm not throwing them away. So it's a two-way thing. Certain bands 
and metal labels like Century Media, with Spotify, they came out and said, we're not going on this. The problem with the streaming and digital is that bands are getting screwed again because they don't get a good enough percentage. But it's here. You know, the Swedish music business is on the up and 83% people, they, they, they listen to stuff digitally. So to me, another point of view, when you're selling your t-shirts, if you play in Scandinavia, they can't buy retail. So you sign a CD, you take some CDs there. Vinyl is always a massive seller, again, when you go on the road. So if you're a certain proggy type band, you do special editions. Luckily for me, with the bands we do, they only still do 15, 20% digital. So a band like OPEF can sell a 150 euro box set. Same with Devin. Loads of vinyl. I mean, Roadburn, I asked the promoter, I said, how much the average person spend? And they said 250 euros per person. They mainly buy vinyl because people collect vinyl. It's like a stamp collector and everything. So, you know, that's the other thing to think about. It's like when you sign in your, your music, don't oversign it, but like you've already given added value. So we can see on our web store that sometimes people have bought 10 copies and it will be a dealer that's going to sell them on. But it's digital is boring to me. I mean, I'm still very old school. I didn't even get a CD player for it. I've only just got an iPod and I don't like it. You know, I like to look at a CD or look at vinyl, but it is here. So you need to. In certain countries, I mean, in Anathema, I booked them and they said, why are we not big here? I said, well, your previous manager wouldn't allow you on Spotify, just so you're not known. So what I'm into doing is to make sure in the future the bands get a fair deal for digital because they're getting screwed again. Because the major companies own parts of Spotify, Pandora, all of these. So if you're on an independent, they haven't got the same power. So. That's something to think about, you know. On one side, with digital, you can release music without creating loads of packaging and expense. But I think the, it kind of loses the art form. The other thing is how people listen to music. Metal is about an album. But kids now are picking one track here, one track there. The other thing to think about digital, on iTunes, you get 79 pence a track. Now, if you're a prog band with two long songs, you're not making money. You have to think about that one. <laughs> because, you know, a band says, yes, we want to do that one whole song. I'm going, well, you're not going to make any money. So the problem there is that your art form and, and commerce is affected. You know, why shouldn't you better do a 40 minute long song? But again, 79 cents is, is not good. For OK, well, uh, we have like a decent amount of people who are here who are from bands or other distributors or distributors or organizers. So if any, anybody has any question, uh, Uber here has the microphone, just raise your hand and you'll be happy to, to reply. Don't be shy. scenes going down, that's a record sales going down. The metal scene has always been there. The thing was it was on the underground and then it comes up and it's pushed down. It's like when you look at uh, sales of magazines in the UK, the enemy is an independent. Kerrang, Metal Hammer, The Outside. No, so, sorry, maybe you got that wrong. I'm talking about overall record sales. If you're a metal band, it's great because people buy t-shirts, Metal is very, very international. So I sit in the car, people I've met from Romania, they're playing uh, Fallujah. I'm like, oh yeah, I know the manager and stuff. And it's amazing to think you're in Romania and they've heard of these bands. Because with pop and indie, it, it, it's much harder. So, so no, I wouldn't say metal's going down, but what it, it's not. When you look at it, Iron Maiden, the brand Iron Maiden, they're known in every country. Everybody knows Iron Maiden. But like, what happens is in the music scene, it gets pushed underground, but then it comes up. You know, you, you, you still look at the biggest gross in bands. I mean, Metallica are up there. Rolling Stones is a rock band, you know? I mean, pop is okay, and you know, One Direction do big business, but you know, are they writing their own songs? So, so no, it's not going down. It's the overall business of selling records is, is down. So, yeah. I have another question, but I don't know if you can 
don't know if you are aware, but there is no market in Romania for the metals. What sort of advice? How, how, to, you, how to create this? Okay, market? you're telling me there's no market. You've got four metal festivals there. That's amazing. That's nearly as many as in England, and obviously you've got two promoters here, and you're all maybe there's too many. So, so to me, looking in in Romania, I'm thinking you've got four festivals. That's great. In England, you have Download, you have Sonosphere, Bloodstock, and then some indoor ones. But those big festivals fight each other. So, to me, looking in, I'm thinking, oh, Romania is good. You've got four festivals. They pay well. So I, I don't know. I mean, for me, as an outsider looking in, it, it's great. But you, you've got to be careful that you don't saturate the market because it's the same in Greece where they have no money and they used to have huge festivals there and it's kind of dropped off. So people have only got so much money and somebody in the car was saying to attend all four festivals would cost 1,500 euros or whatever. Who's got that? So, you know. Yeah, probably was referring that uh, even though there are four festivals in Romania, which are, uh, judging from, from the lineup and everything, are pretty major, yeah, you can compare it with Europe. But uh, the, probably he's referring that the reality of the situation is that Romania has doesn't have the economic power to cover uh, the existence of all these four festivals. So probably next year or two years later, there's going to be only two festivals, for example. Yeah, but it, this goes on, you know, even countries that have got strong GDP, like in Germany, the festivals are going down. In, in Britain, there's too many festivals, loads are going bankrupt. And, uh, so, you know, it's like one, if you're doing a festival, you get sponsorship, or you're a festival, boutique festivals are the things that are working. What I don't like is, I'm a download, all of a sudden I'm drinking this kind of beer, I've got this crap burger, I think people, and what's happening in England, they call it like VIP tickets, glamping, because again, people want, and they expect a bit more, so, you know, when you talk about the finances, it's going on in other countries as well, it's not just about how much people earn here, it is, if there's too much of something, yeah, somebody's going to die from it. I mean, when I say die, like economically, but it's it's going on everywhere, definitely. And, uh, you know, um, I don't know if it was like an email from you. I'm like, well, maybe you need a promoters association or something here, because you are an industry. So, you know, you've got to protect... What, I'm sorry, what I wanted to say is that, um, for example, if I have a band, I have three bands, and I want to go in clubs in Romania, do you think it's a good idea to create uh, a network of clubs? For example, to invest and create a network of clubs where promote metal music. This yeah, I mean, you know, I've come to this, right? It was packed last night. This is a good, yeah, this is a good club. And, you know, believe me, you can tour in America and you play terrible places. Yeah, you can build a fan base in Romania. That's not going to make you successful, but you've got to start. One thing you can do by playing here is build a fan base make sure you're good live so that when you go to the other countries so yeah but don't expect obviously yeah you know i mean whoever the biggest band in romania is i mean yeah you're not going to make a lot of money but you can use this as your training ground to to perfect your art you know because that's the problem you see in other countries it's like bands too often they go to london and they play for record labels and they're not ready so sometimes bands that don't have massive scenes are so busy rehearsing and creating that the, the, the quality of the musicianship is very good. Okay. Hi Andy. Uh, so you're in an underground band. You've done the experience part. You've played gigs. You have a record deal and you're trying to expand to Europe, okay? But, what? <laughs> Are you a singer? Yeah, no. <laughs> Luckily I'm not. So, uh, what is your uh, uh, opinion on getting noticed or getting in touch with an uh, agent, uh, a booking agency or a management uh, outside? Yeah. Well, obviously you need to do that. The reality is with an agent, when they go, what label are you on? That's boring anyway, because of the internet. But it's very hard getting agents. So sometimes it's like, 
I would approach all of these people, or the other thing is, it's not really a buy-on, but like you contribute towards a bus. So there are bands that can't afford to tour, or you know, you forge alliances with similar bands, or you know, because you're all part of the brotherhood or whatever, so you do it that way. But yeah, for a band, and you know, we had the discussion before, you need to have an agent, yeah, a European agent. I'm telling you, like an agent in the UK, will have more power than somebody in Germany, because we're a bit like, oh, the German agent, you've still got that, that does go on. But yeah, that's the, the, the thing you need to do, because you know, you've got your deal, you need to play outside, but it's very hard. You've got a great record, you're big in your own country, but you can't get anywhere else. But if you don't get an agent, go direct to certain things. I, you know, we discuss Road Burners, Damnation, and you know, they'll, they'll take a shot. I mean, we picked up a band called Obsidian Kingdom from, from, from Spain, and you know, we got them on a few festivals, so it is possible, but if you can't get an agent, you go direct yourself, you find out who these people are, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not an agent, I love booking gigs now, and I know people everywhere, and it's, you know, I'm done, you know, India, that we dealt on email, and I'm saying, right, I'll have three slots on the festival, but it's like, you can do it yourself, it's just that for a promoter, it doesn't matter if your band is brilliant, they have to sell tickets. So you need to be prepared to lose money. But I think I think that mic doesn't like me. So yeah, uh, we have our own band, we have our own backline. We are not in it to make money. I mean. We're investing in ourselves to get to the to, to get bigger outside. But the thing is that with promoters outside of Romania, it's pretty impossible to make them even listen to you. You know, yeah. because everything is uh, made on connections, and they have their own circles, and they have their own by the bands that they want to promote. That's, that's true, yeah. I mean, there's politics, everybody's pulling favours, but it still doesn't mean that you can't keep knocking on the door. There are some people that still believe in music in good bands. You know, for me, I can come to Romania or come somewhere, if a band's good, I want to I wanna at least try and give them a leg up, you know, because if we don't have tomorrow's Metallicas, there's nothing, the business goes down, so... It is, I understand it's difficult, but you know, the major thing is to get the names. Don't be just putting where these festivals have info at or something. If you've got a name, you can get through. Put a thing so you can see whether the person's read it as well. And then, you know, the other thing, like I said, you know, I, I answer like just about all emails, but don't become annoying. But it's a case of, uh, there are still good and I was talking about this in LA, passionate people. And that's what's missing in the music industry, to be passionate, you know? I, I saw a band in LA, and I was like, I absolutely love this band, and it excited me. But some of the other managers there, they're like real old guys, and they're all like, I think they upset the younger generation, because they're like, oh, it's all shit now, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, you know, you just gotta keep going. And the other thing when you talk about agents, you know, you have the bigger ones and the smaller ones. In Holland, there's, there's all sorts of little agencies that have got scenes and, you know, as I say, Paradise Lost, you know, did 12 dates in, in, in Holland. It was all the underground fanzine thing, you know, they would eat vegan stew and live in a van and that's, and that, those kind of scenes are still there. But you have to discover them and also or find a band that you think musically suits you and get in touch with them and say look you know you can play with us in Romania that's the other way to do it is create the scene with, with the bands you know whether you gig swap and then people get to see you but there are still good people out there I might seem like I never get a reply and we get a reply but you know there are thank you somewhere else yeah I think we Don't be shy. Okay, until someone uh, pops up another question, you mentioned earlier about buy-ins. Buy-ons. Buy-ons. Uh, okay. Realistically speaking, what money are we talking about here, uh, and how do you uh, basically get it back, or at least make the investment worthy? Right, a buy-on. Yeah. 
basically in the, in the 70s, the whole term for a buy-on was that you could pay to support the band. You didn't get anything. You didn't get to go on a bus. And people hate buy-ons now, but as a manager, I can understand. It's like, if you're going to take a band that doesn't mean any tickets, doesn't have a big market, because you do a buy-on. So for example, I'm 21 years old, the first band, I uh, was managing that band on Warners, we had a lot of money, we supported Ozzy Osbourne, it cost 8,000 pounds. We got nothing, Sharon Osbourne's like 8,000 pounds. So, oh, no problem, Warner will pay and stuff. So what's happening now is that bands, even some of my bands, the tour bus is about 1,000 euros a day, so they can't break even. So when you call it buy-on, I call it contribution towards production. So you look for a band to help you cover the costs. So for me, sometimes I have to go to a Finnish, Norwegian, or a Dutch band, somebody where the government pay, pays money. But it's, the investment is huge. I mean, uh, there was a certain band that you like anyway, and they were saying it's 24,000 pounds to come on this bus, and I'm looking, they're only gonna pay to 150 a night. So, you know, the thing about this business, you have to invest. So do a gig locally, save up, invest. I mean, you've got to be careful where, if for example, you do a buy-on and you're playing at doors opening and you've got a 25 minute set, that's not good. So when you do the deal, stipulate you want 40 minutes, you don't want to go on stage until 30 minutes after the door, X amount of bucks, find out what you want. Because the other thing is, you. Also, you go to a tour bus and you don't know the other band, it can be awkward as well. But it, that's just pure economics, so expect to lose money, because bands are assigned, you know, with Catatonia we spent loads of money trying to break America. Now we're a headline situation. Paradise Lost in America never worked. And I showed them the accounts and like, you didn't make as big a profit because we toured with Nightwish, we toured with whoever, and they go, oh, well, let's forget America. So. At different levels, it's investment. So, yeah, so a buy on these days is it means sharing the costs or, or a, a nightliner. In the old days, you would pay just for the honor to support. The other thing is, you know, in the old days, but support that would get 50 pounds, 50 euros, that would be it. So it's very, it's changed, that's changed, but this whole concept of, um, yeah, because you know, I've got a band, it's successful, your band wants to support, and I'm like, well you don't, you don't mean any tickets, there's no buzz on your band, so in a way, why shouldn't you uh, pay? It is unethical, but when you look at a pure business, you're trying to take my fan base. So the other thing is, if you do a buy-on, it's also you better take that band's fan base. I've seen too many, the other thing you need to say is, can we put our backdrop up? If they say no, then you make sure you have scrims at the side. You make sure you say that your band's name, otherwise you're wasting your money. Like, I mean, I've just been offered a, a big gig with Dream Theater for Devin Townsend, and I'm saying, look, we want screens. Of course they won't let us have screens. But these are really important things, otherwise you're wasting your money. You could support the biggest band in the world that you're on when uh, doors are opening, people haven't come through, people don't know who you are, make sure it's on the drum. So that's the important thing, if you do that, you go out and you steal the audience. Years ago, Southern Death Cult, that became the cult, supported Theatre of Hate, and they went out and took the audience. And that's what you've got to do. I've seen so many bands mumble onto stage, you know, they, 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 they just not even saying who they are. That's a waste of time. So you have to look at it. It's an investment in your future. But like when you agree the terms, make stipulations, about certain things that you can put up. You know, I can tell you, if you want to support my band, you are not having a backdrop. So you have to have scrims, because you know, we have all different things. But these are important things, otherwise you go into it blind, it's gonna be a waste of time. Anyone with a question? Okay, we have Uh, when you record a new material, 
to make before they release the material, uh, make a single, like in the uh, other industries, pop, pop industries, or I don't think, I don't know, uh, other kind of music. They release a single and, uh, before they promote full material and they release a video clip for that. Do you think it's better or is better the old way, the rock market? Well, you know, I mean, people even in the metal scene, we still do what they call them singles, we call them lead tracks. Um, I'd still say that's a good thing to do, because the other, if you're a kind of band that you've written an album and you are going to get radio, but your fan base is pretty hardcore, you don't go with your commercial track, everyone says I'm sold out, so yeah, there are ways of introducing a song and putting a buzz out there. The latest Paradise Lost album has got some death metal vocals, so there's one track out there that's creating a buzz on the internet, so that's important. Videos, you know, YouTube is so easy. Like for me, if somebody says, oh, I'm in a band, I would quickly check YouTube. It's easier than downloading Dropbox and all that sort of business. So yeah, you still do that because I think you can create the initial buzz. But if you are a band where you think you've got a crossover um, track and it's going to get radio, you've got to be very careful because, you know, fans can get very bitchy and, oh, you're not what you were and you're not growling anymore and all of that sort of stuff. So. But you know, I mean, the last Opeth record, we didn't even make a video because we just they didn't really get round to it. And at the end of the day, they should do one, but we haven't really worried about it. So it works for certain bands. And um, but yeah, getting back to it, yeah, we definitely yeah pick your lead track, but don't always go with the strongest. I mean, it depends. You know, obviously, the style of your music, you're not talking about radio, but it's. Yeah, because it's, you create the initial buzz, so, you know, when we were launching an album, we would go with what we call a lead track, and then the album. In the old days, say, Bon Jovi and that would be three singles, album. But that's very expensive to do, because videos were about 100,000 euros in the past, whereas now people do them cheaper, but it's, uh, it's not the money. The other thing is, it's not the... Again, coming back to Robin Metal, it's not, they don't invest enough time. They used to take four albums to break a band. Most days, now, two albums in, on a major, they drop you if, you if you're not big. So, it's all important how you, you know, deal with introducing yourself you know, to the market. Yeah, I would, I would do that, yeah. Anybody else? Flash, they had that song Complete Control, but you know, their deal was pretty heavy with CBS. So I would say, yeah, band, it depends on the demand. I mean, I always look at contracts and have it, because, because we're not dealing with commercial stuff, you can have control. There's some terrible deals out there. Now, if I'm managing the band, it's very important the band knows their own art. They should know how to promote it better than everyone. The problem is that with bands, when you argue about what is going to be the track for the video, what they think it might be not what the label thinks. So, no, I mean, I'm experiencing, to be honest, now, right, I was saying sales have gone down. A strong manager in a band, we've got more power than we ever had before. The record company is more secondary. So, it's, I think artistic control is very important. As an artist, you need to listen. You might think that'll work on radio, but somebody's job is to go to radio people, they do know better than you. And sometimes that's a problem conveying that to bands, but it depends on the contract. Some metal labels, yeah, the contracts are tough, but they let you do stuff. I mean, a major label, you have an A&R man comes into the studio and they're telling you, change this bit by the producer, whereas the bands I do with the record company never comes to the studio. We're like, this is it, you put it out. Uh, and another question, is there any um, scene in the UK uh, big enough for bands to play uh, Vintage Rock or 
Classic rock is, is massive in England now. So Earache Records made their name on Grindcore. You know, it was like you buy Earache. Now Earache have got right for Sons, Temperance Movement, Blackberry Smoke, and they put them in the charts. That kind of classic rock, classic rock magazine is a massive seller. In England at the moment, that stuff's huge. Rival Sons are an American band. They're bigger in the UK and America. So the, the, there's definitely that scene of being influenced by the Stones and those kind of bands, and that's, that's really in at the moment in England. And then one last question, which is a problem with the Do you think that there will ever be a criminal band like, like say, or the Beatles, or rather, definitely the Sonic Beatles, which is the Beatles? Well, there will never be one the size of the record sales, but, um, yeah, I mean, I have to believe that. And that's something the promoters are saying, who are tomorrow's headliners? Because, you know, oh, it's Metallica again. You know, it's the same band spinning around. So, you know, Avenged Sevenfold have come up to be a headliner. Whether you're going to get a band like the Beatles that can write songs like that, I don't know. But it's, um, I think certainly bands to build up. So, so today's big band, so it's certainly not a band that they headline all festivals. You know, Slayer are not as big as they were, but they're still on all of these festivals. So, certainly in terms of record sales, it's not possible. In terms of um, audiences, I think it is possible. You know, Woodstock Festival in Poland is 700,000, it's free or something, which is huge. That's bigger than the original Woodstock. So, that is there because also I think people have got more access to music. but. I don't know, you know, the Beatles to me it's about songwriting, but it was a different era that you got to see that people came through the war and the 50s and then the 60s is music and it was like a revolution at the time, so it was also something new, which is almost like music for people in Eastern Europe, you go back to communist times and then uh, this must be so new for you and that, that's what's exciting, but um, I mean I hope there is that band there, but who knows. Thank you. Uh, you. Yeah, somewhere else? Okay, you were mentioning earlier about deals and contracts and everything. Uh, can you go more deep into the subject? Right, so I mean, you're in bands, you want a record deal. First thing I'd say, get a license deal. Does everyone know the difference? Uh, maybe we should explain. Okay, when you sign a record deal, the record company owns that recording forever. It's a 50-year copyright thing, but it's like you never get it back. If you do a license, you own a master, and you're licensing it to a label for 10 to 12 years, and you get it back. So it's all about owning your copyrights. Metal labels generally want to do record deals, but a lot of the ones out of Germany and stuff, they're used to license deals. Roadrunner, for example, in America won't do license, they'll do a record deal. So that's the first thing is about owning your master. So you can still do a deal, they'll say, we'll sign you. I was talking to someone, they said, oh, we paid for the recording. They'll still give you an advance, but get a license deal. The other thing is, make sure they haven't got rights for too long. The other, when you look at royalties, they say, we will give you this. So if they give you 20% of dealer, what you have to know is how much is this in euros and cents or the bond. Because what they do is they say, we give you this, and then we only pay it on 90, and then we have packaging deductions. Packaging deductions are a rip-off from the 70s when it was vinyl, and stuff would break. So I try and say on a CD, there's no packaging deductions. Special edition maybe. So on your royalty, don't just think, I've got 22, 25%, it's all what and what they're taking off. So it's very important on a, the royalty point of view. The other thing is, do, does everyone know what recoupable is? I don't even know what right. recoupable is. Recoupable, so a record company will say, right, we will do this, but it's recoupable, not returnable, recoupable. So it's a bit like having a mortgage on a house, you have to pay it back. So you make your album, it's recoupable. A video is recoupable. 
to all support is recoupable. So you spent a hundred thousand euros, you would have to sell 120,000 albums for break even, roughly. So you have need to look at what is recoupable. If they're going to make PR recoupable, and they don't have an in-house press person argue that point. So the other thing is you have to look at what they're charging you, because sometimes they'll charge you for everything. And so the royalty, recoupability, and ownership of masters are, are the really important things. This, which will bring me into publishing, that if you own your master, you you can make more money, like in the future, it's like as well as from the publishing side. Okay. Yeah, because uh, we actually had a debate on publishing earlier and it was pretty an interesting subject in, uh, in the given context. So yeah, uh, let's talk a bit about publishing, what it means, especially like uh, the case earlier when someone leaves the band and they have some misunderstandings about uh, legal stuff. So does everyone know what publishing is? No? Okay, so I mean, publishing is to do with the songs. So when you do a publishing deal, you are assigning the songs to people. And these create a different kind of royalty to a record royalty. But when you're in a band, if you are a songwriter, you're going to be the richest guy. So you look at uh, the jam. Paul Weller, he split the band, he's very well off. The other two are doing from the jam. The police, there's another band. So it was a massive difference. If you're a successful band, the guy who writes the songs is going to make more money. What I try and do is say, look, these guys are playing your songs, so you should give them a little bit of publishing income. So, in publishing, we've talked about the uh, collection societies, but so what you do on publishing, one, don't sign a contract that says life of copyright. I told you about the Beatles thing, so you want a retention period. So you were signing for somebody for 10 to 12 years after the term. So with publishing, you press a record, it creates a mechanical royalty, about 50 cents. If you get played on a Radio 1 rock show in England, it's 44 pounds. So if you've got a song that's been played on radio, it generates a lot of money. The other thing is like music and films, adverts, games, there's a lot of money there. Games, they don't give you a royalty anymore, but it's like, I had a band, an unsigned band on Grand Theft Auto 4, they gave us $5,000, but it obviously, kid, more kids are playing games than uh, listening to music, so that's a way of getting yourself a new audience. But within a band, make sure you're very clear who writes the songs. It's always difficult for the drummer, unless you're Lars Ulrich, who's getting credited. You know, how do you say, oh, or do you tell the drummer what to play? How do you define a song? The other thing is, be careful with producers. If their manager's trying to get an arrangement credit, they're going to earn on the publishing. So how it works is, lyrics is 50%, music's 50. So if you're the writer of the lyrics, technically, and you've written the melody, you can make more. So be very clear, within the band, you percentage splits. So I have a publishing company and what I do is the band comes to me and I say, well, I can't manage you, but I sign their publishing, I help them get a record deal, help them get agents. So, you know, I sign bands like Cult Luna, The Ocean, all of these kind of bands that kind of help their career. But it is an area that's, uh, in the metal scenes, forgotten about. All the independent metal labels have their own publishing companies, but they're not really exploiting publishing rights which can generate income so it's you know unfortunately in the future bands might be signed to brands you might be signed to coca-cola you know one of the late red bull records is an energy drink you've got shit loads of money so it's kind of again with the publishing it's uh, very important that you, you know who wrote what and you make sure you've got very fair deals. That is really where the money is. The, the record side, if you have a big selling record, the publishing income is very big. So again, when you do a gig, maybe not here, but like if you play a festival, or you're supporting a big band, and you're a support band, 3% of the gross receipts are deducted. So if you're supporting Metallica at an arena gig, on your publishing income, from performance income, you could, you could probably make uh, 
thousand euro just from that. So these, these are important things. I know bands that have been going 20 years around the publishing deal that don't know about filling these forms out. The other thing, as a musician, there's all kinds of money out there that never gets collected. PPL is another thing that this is not for writers, it's for performers. So if you perform on a record, there is another royalty that is generated in PPL. Most bands have no idea. It's called GBL in Germany, it's Gramax in Scandinavia. You probably don't have it here, but it's, there's a lot of money out there from people collect that the musician never sees because either the manager doesn't know what it is, they've never heard about it. So it's very, all these collection societies are very, very important. The Paradise has to translate their contract to German, join GBL, and then all of a sudden they got a massive check. Now, if I didn't know about GBL, we would have never got that money. There's money out there. I even saw on uh, PPL, Michael Jackson had not got some money. And it, it's money sloshing about. So, you know, on top of the publishing, these are all these other rights, they call uh, performing rights societies, which is for you as a musician or as a songwriter. So they are out there collecting because I think in the 60s, you know, a lot of big acts got ripped off and they didn't make any money. So, you know, these, these things are important. Musicians union, I'm not so into that because it's a bit old school and trying to unionize stuff. But, so definitely look into these societies, I would say. Uh, for example, like there are a lot of bands in Romania that opened for, for big bands from uh, Europe or the US. Uh, they didn't get any money. Uh, Mostly because they're not uh, well documented, they're not well registered, or there aren't any uh, solid options in Romania to get registered to get income. So, is there an option to maybe search uh, some sort of, of uh, rights and registers on, in other countries? That's an interesting one. So, yeah, technically, say you came to to me and I published your band. I, could, I would go through PRS. So there are ways of going to other societies. When you go to America, they have ASCAP, BMI, and CESAC. What's interesting there, they don't actually pay live performance income apart from CESAC. So I don't know what goes on here, and I'm sure as promoters, you probably don't pay that money. And I know if I promote a state, I'll just sign this form and whatever. But it's, uh, it's possible for you, yes, to assign to a different collection society. You don't have to necessarily just stay here. But if you don't publish a deal, half of that, uh, what we call performing rights income is collected by the publisher anyway, and then they account. So that gives you power. Because the other thing is, if you're UK or America, they get this money quicker. You know, it takes ages as it goes through. Germany, gamers do it, and then there's cultural deductions, and all this money goes everywhere. But so, so when you're saying they've supported, they're probably not in there. I don't know, do you pay these fees here as a promoter? I mean, as a promoter, yeah, we do taxes, but not tax, not tax. So you pay to the right society. Yeah, you because are, from okay. the taxes, money goes to the society, but the society doesn't pay the artist. Right. Okay, well. That's, that's the problem. Yeah. I mean, you know, you do see that in England that these societies got big flash offices and they're on a hundred times in a year, but uh, maybe again, as artists, you need to assert yourself. These people are supposed to be working for you, the songwriters, so, you know, you've got to question them. But it, it was the same in England, it was like dealing with the tax office, so but if you get a contact there, you know, maybe if you do other seminars, you should invite somebody from a, from a right society would be, be really important, which is what we do in England. The PRS will come and talk to musicians. So that'd be a good thing to do, yeah. Yeah, there have been a lot of talks about uh, doing uh, some sort of artist union in, in Romania. I mean, there are artist unions, but in terms of like metal, rock, underground, uh, everything is really dissolved. You said that uh, from your point of view, this sort of music union doesn't help. Uh, the musicians union, I don't like it because they're very kind of, any kind of union where you're forced to be in a union, I don't, don't think that, that that's free. I don't think you necessarily need to have a union to put people off, but you can certainly have a collective of people 
where you discuss problems of you as bands or songwriters, and you know, the more of you, you have more power than, than being by yourself. It doesn't have to be an official union. No. Okay. Anybody, any other questions? Yeah, uh, so the, the thing is like this. Uh, for a concert, the promoter pays from 5 to 8% uh, from the incomes to the union. UCM, uh, UCMR, yeah. In order for the artist to get that money, he needs to have the songs uh, registered there, yeah. And then you have to ask for them because they will not give it willingly. And yeah. also, as a band, you have to not sign when you sign the contract with the promoter. Usually, he will introduce in the contract a form that says that you are license, licensing him for the rights of the songs. If you do not accept that, then you are entitled to the money. Yeah, that does go on in countries. That is illegal, and really the society should be on the case there. But it's, it's just important that when you go on tour, you fill out the forms. I mean, you can do it online. I always make sure you do it handwritten. You get the promoter to sign it, and you chase up. But believe me, these bands have been going 20 years. They did they don't get it together. And I know it will probably be tough here, and like you say, you don't get the money. In. But you know, again, if there's enough of you investigating, but it's like anything, if you don't ask, you don't get. Somebody's there with your money, that's just how it is. And also, the period of time uh, in which you can take the money is two years. So if you have a gig two years ago, you can still take the money. And in Romania, we have Credit Down, which is uh, the union for all the uh, televised uh, performances, in which you should take the money, but usually in Romania all the money goes to a certain genre of music. Yeah. Which Manele. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, this kind of corruption or whatever, I mean, it goes on, as I say, people, they don't know about collecting, but if more of you are knocking on the door saying this is our right, then you're, you're going to get it. But it's, yeah, like you say, if it's your local music, so in Germany, when Gamer collects, an X amount of it goes to cultural, probably all part of our music or what have you. But, you know, I just say keep knocking on the door of these people because if you don't ask, you don't get it. Any other questions? And then Ed looks like uh, we're at the end. Um, if you want to uh, clarify something or just um, you feel there are some subjects that have been approached. Well, I don't know. I mean, was there any areas that we didn't cover? I mean, we looked at records, publishing, touring, rights societies, budgets. Is there anything out there? You know, one thing we didn't talk about, but I do need to go to the toilet, I'm happy to talk about it, but it's you were back to Romania about international touring, about how you get out there. I mean, is anybody interested in, in, in that? I can tell you that a lot of people are interested in this, but they're probably too shy to do it. <laughs> so yeah, maybe uh, take the lead on this one. Okay. Because, you know, when I've been here, sometimes people, they say to me, oh, the Romanian bands, they're a bit, they, they, they don't want to really go out there and work, you know. The bottom line is, touring is very tough. Nobody else you're living. You're going out there and you can play to five people. You have to play 150%. You know, there are bands, they go, oh, I'm not playing, there's no one. You know, I was joking, saying, if there's not an audience here, I'm not going on. But, you know, if there's two people over here. So, you know, the international touring, I think what you've got to do is, Look at a market, you think you, whatever your style of music and what does well, and try and go to that country. So, you know, here in Romania, so obviously a lot of bands now you start with that Eastern European thing, and then you can go down through uh, Bulgaria, go to Turkey, go to uh, Greece. There's no money in Greece, but like Turkey, you know, there's a good scene there. So, it's about with the internet, I'm being an internet, it doesn't matter, you're from Romania, it doesn't matter, you know, all from around, the people who played here, he wasn't happy, they were wanting to, I'm going to say, you know, they're from Israel, bands are from New Zealand or wherever, you know, where you are in Romania is, you know, you're not, a, you're not in, you know, there's bands from Iceland, you can do it, you know, there's all of Europe there, there's not the barriers anymore, so, 
you need to pick markets you think will work for you. So for example, if you're a kind of extreme band, you could say, right, I want to do Inferno Festival in, in Norway or something, or Damnation in the UK. So pick these events, but actually think where they work. And as far as markets go, if you wanted to get deals, you know, UK is very important. It's, it is a successful market. People think Germany, they sell more records, but on the live scene and magazine, the UK is very important. So pick your market. It's like I have a band that's big in Belgium. You know, Belgium, we sell 800 albums there, it's Belgium. So you, you have to think like, where are markets that will work? You know, Scandinavia, they've got money up there. How do you get there? That's the other thing with touring, it's very expensive, because even going from Hamburg upwards, so you've got to look at your tour. Italy, Spain, the Latin countries, they love live, but they don't buy records, because their president, doesn't stop bootlegging and stuff. So pick a market where you think your music will work and do it. Or otherwise, just start out with all your neighboring countries. You know, when these people think they came from Serbia or whatever, the, you know, the world is smaller. But I do sometimes get a feeling bands are like, oh, well, it's tough for us because we're in this country, you know? We're all in Europe. Just get out there and. Uh, but, but, but pick where you want to go or, or where you think your music will work. So France, for example, is a huge country with a massive market, but a very peculiar musical taste. Only certain things work there, so you have to think culturally will they get it. There's English bands that don't work in Germany, because Germans like that big, give them like that. So you have to think, how does it work? Is somebody singing? An Englishman singing about a certain thing, you know, Ramstein is singing in German, but it works because it's like marching music in the way German language is, which also brings me to, you know, names, logos. You've got to think internationally. If I can't say your name, you're going to have a problem. I can just about say Kibalata, but you know, we were discussing this last night. So think on a global scale. So. Make sure it's a name that can be said, that can be read, you know? So I was doing a, a panel in Norway and all these extreme bands, I can't even read it because of the spiky logo, and then they told me what their name was, and I said, well, what does that mean? And it was in Norwegian. So that's the other thing is, as a band, think globally. What will work internationally? The name is very important, the, 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 the logos and things like that, because sometimes, when you start out, you just want to be big in your country. You don't think internationally. So I've seen a few bands here, and you know the ones that have got easy names, I can come away and remember them. You know, yeah, I, the others I, I can't. You know, and, and so that that's an important thing when you're thinking about international. Um, but yeah, so pick your markets. Maybe instead of just touring, try and get on specialist festivals. As I said, like Damnation in the UK, they take a chance, you know, they will take a chance on the band. You won't get paid much or even at all. But it means there are people there that like the underground music. And then, you know, these are the kind of people that you're going to get support. Because if you have got a massive company pushing you, you have to go out there and, and, and find it or look at the bands. You know, and I was discussing this festival here and I said, well, you know, it's pretty extreme, your bill. And he said, well, you don't need it to be extreme. So you have to think, you know, where. So as I said, there's festivals that might have like black metal, death metal, but then they've got stoner or they've got post rock. So it's very important to, you are looking where you're going to enter the market. And again, remember, you are a business, so that name is so important. You know what I mean? Coca-Cola, love it or hate it, is all around the world. And for the same with McDonald's, but they're successful logos. Yeah, well, I mean, the band, you are a business. So for me, I like run the band's businesses. So some of my bands have got four companies. So when you go on tour or things like that, I don't know whether you have limited companies here where you have protection. So there's different types of businesses, but you have to have some company structure because also when you go to France, for example, it's so bureaucratic there, you need 
even though we're only in Europe, there's certain tax things you need. So what I'm saying is, a band doesn't want to say, we're a brand, we are a business. But you are, not a record label, so everything's going to channel through your company. So you can say, I have bands, and they say, oh, we're getting a Christmas bonus. I'm like, do you think you've done well this year? This is your company, here's the accounts, you're a director in it, no, you've done shit. So there's no bonus. So you're not working for the record company to manage it. You set up your own company. So it's really important as you get bigger that you do that. Because the other thing is, I took on a band that can't say we were, we never paid any tax, right? In a country that doesn't mess around, you got a huge, huge fine. So I took them on, I had to talk them for two years to pay this bill off. So I don't know, like, you know, what it's like here with taxes, but that's the other thing. When I'm saying you're a business, Make sure you get, that's my nickname, you get a receipt for everything. Otherwise, you're going to be taxed on your income. So you do need to think, even you know, if you have no manager or accountant, be responsible. Don't get bogged down in business and everything, but you, at the end of the day, it is your business. Not a manager, not the label. So it's, it's important to have that and have an understanding. I have had artists who've been going 20 years, and I'm like, how you got a receipt? They're like, no, I'm like, you're not being reimbursed. They soon learn. If they don't produce the receipt, they don't get the money back. So when you go on tour, you know, you get the petrol receipts, the hotel receipts, everything, food, and you put it through. Because otherwise, if the government come along and say, you made this amount of money, it's going to tax you. So it is important that you think you are a business. Anyone else? Okay, well, Andy, I guess this is uh, this is the this is the end. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this, and uh, hopefully we we'll get a second chance to do this second visit. Okay, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, I'll be very impressed with the sound bill. You know, some really good bands. It's a good club. You've got a festival, beautiful town. So thanks very much, and thanks for people coming today. And, we're going to travel and stuff. So that's it. <laughs>